right. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> trying to get situated here. The time snuck up on me. <laughs> get my. We are uh, continuing in the letter to the Colossians, and we are going to pick up in Colossians 1.15 this morning. Uh, but we'll do a little background review first, just to catch up. Sometimes it happens. Uh, we have a Sunday class, and then we have a singing, uh, and then. You know, we want to make sure that we don't forget what we covered in the previous Sunday. So we'll do that in just a moment. Before we do, let's go to our Father in prayer. Lord in heaven, we humble ourselves before you. We fall down in reverence in your presence, worshiping your name, lifting you up, giving you glory, asking that you would strengthen us with your power, that you would teach us to rule the way Jesus did with compassion and love and righteousness and justice. We're so grateful for his rulership and his, his kingship in our lives. Help us to submit to him. Help us to follow him. Help us to sacrifice for him. We're so grateful for your word and the way that it transforms our hearts. And we pray that you will use it this morning to change us so that Christ can be in us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So Paul is writing this letter from prison in Rome after who told him? that the Colossian brethren are doing well. You remember? Who told Paul about the Colossians' well-being? <laughs> oh, I'm hearing some something. <laughs> okay, yeah, Epaphras. All right, Epaphras, very good. Uh, had Paul ever personally been to Colossae? No, doesn't seem like it. Uh, it seems like Epaphras is the one who established the church there and established the church in Laodicea and potentially in Hierapolis, you know, the, the, that kind of cluster of three churches that is all there together in Asia Minor. Um, what was the major issue that they were facing? Yeah, Terry. Teaching. Yeah, so false teaching, heretical teaching. Yeah, exactly. We don't, and that's the thing, we don't really know the exact nature of it. Uh, we're going to get into that in the next class. We're going to kind of try to f figure out maybe what was going on, uh, but it's very difficult. There's debate over that, but, but basically it's some sort of man-made philosophy that is threatening the church in some way and that is undermining the superiority of Jesus and his knowledge. Basically, almost claiming like we have a greater source of knowledge. And if you, if you have the knowledge that we have, well, then you can, be, you can be saved. And so what was the main message of Colossians? Do you remember? How do we summarize it? Jesus and his knowledge are yeah, Jesus and his knowledge are superior. In this letter, there's just a huge emphasis on how great Jesus is, how great his knowledge is, how he's the ultimate source of knowledge. So what that means is any human being or even any angelic being that, that humans think that they saw in a vision, if they tell you something that contradicts the knowledge of Jesus, they are to be completely disregarded. And in the opening verse, you remember Paul compared the Colossians to fruitful trees that are nourished by the wisdom and knowledge of Jesus, like trees are nourished by water, and then, and then they bear fruit throughout the world. Uh, some good self-reflection questions based on that metaphor would be, am I bearing fruit for the Lord? Am I spending every day soaking up His wisdom? from his word, like a tree soaks up water, or does it feel kind of like my, my roots are just dry? Do I feel firmly rooted in, in my faith in Jesus, or am I kind of easily toppled when circumstances of life don't go, don't go my way? And am I walking in the light, or am I kind of filling my heart and surrounding myself with the darkness of, of this world. Paul, Paul's really grateful for the Colossians because by the power of God's spirit through the gospel, it's like they're becoming this, this new garden of Eden where they can produce fruit and, and live and flourish in a way that God can look at it and say, this is very good and can be well-pleasing in his sight. I think there's a lot of very rich lessons uh, from the tree imagery that we can draw. And the wisdom literature understands that, so that's why there's a lot about that in Proverbs and, and Psalms and a lot of other places. Uh, any comments and questions from that introductory material? Uh, in, in verse 15, Paul's going to pause and make sure everybody knows just how great Jesus is. So we're going to get into that 
great, amazing poem. But any comments or questions before that, just on any of the uh, introductory material? Will? Okay, good. Yeah, that is an example of being firmly rooted. When you hear something that contradicts the Bible, contradicts Jesus, you're not, you know, you're not just going to fall over and, and, and fall for that. Uh, Paul uses other imagery in Ephesians 4 about like a ship on a sea just tossed about by every wind and wave of doctrine that, that comes along. Yeah, so really, yeah, really good. Really good. All right. Uh, well, here in these five verses, this is uh, in the original Greek, it reads like a poem. You, you kind of lose it in the English, but it, it's so dense and it's just so packed with meaning. I really want to work through this together and spend probably the majority of our class on this poem. So if you feel like, wow, we're spending a lot of time and I don't really want to make a comment or question because Brian has to move on to, you know, we got to get all the way through chapter two, verse seven. Uh, don't worry about that because number one, uh, we're only going to go through uh, the end of chapter one this morning in class. We're scheduled to do through verse seven of chapter two, but I'm preaching on that. I'm preaching on Colossians two, one through seven. So in Bible class, we're just going to go to the end of chapter one, spend the majority of our time on this uh, particular poem here. So let's go ahead and read this. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Um, actually, I wanted to stop in verse 17, so we'll, we'll pause there for just a second. Uh, really what Paul's doing here is he's showing that Jesus is the old creator, he's the new creator, <laughs> and he's the embodiment of wisdom. The reason why I wanted to stop at verse 17 and went a little too far uh, is because th this is really where Paul's showing that Jesus is the old creator. And by old, I mean the original Genesis creator. So he says he's the image of the invisible God. And, and probably what comes to all of our minds when we hear that is what Dave talked about in the Lord's Supper, that human beings were made in the image of God. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Matt? Okay. We have a mind. Yeah. Consciousness. Sure. Maybe even conscience built into that, this kind of moral sense of right and wrong and, and ought. thought I saw another hand over here. David? We're going to live forever just like God. Somewhere we're going to live forever. Okay, yeah. So he created us to be uh, living eternally uh, with him. Yeah, really good. Yeah. This, this phrase brings into the idea of the, that we have a purpose. And in Jesus, when you look at him, we just see what our purpose is supposed to be. Yeah. And um, you know, that's, that's the driver for us. Okay, yeah, so we're created to, to actually serve God's purposes. Yeah, Terry? When I think of this, I think, that, uh, I think of a stamp. You know, if okay. you notarize something, mm -hmm. and how that image that's on that piece of paper is the exact representation of that stamp. And I think about this, and that Jesus is the exact representation of God. Yeah. And I think it's a, a, I also like the word here. Now, he is the image versus Genesis when we were created in God's image. There's, yeah. a, there's a definite difference there. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, so um, that's a good, I'm, I'm going to hold on to that and bring that back up in a second. You know, if you just think about it, it, it means that we're, we're in God's likeness. We share God's characteristics. And what you all are doing is bringing up specific ways in which we, we share his characteristics. That, that's absolutely right. Um, we're, we're physical representations of God on the earth. Uh, if you think about uh, kings in ancient times, they would actually set up statues of themselves throughout their kingdom to remind their citizens of their goodness and their authority and all that. So we're, we're kind of like walking, talking, you know, living statues of God that go about the earth. And when people look at us, they, they are reminded 
of God's authority and, and his goodness and his character. Uh, I, I, I think another analogy here is really helpful. In Genesis 5.3, it says, When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness according to his image. And he named him Seth. I think this is so helpful because when you have kids, don't your kids kind of look like you? <laughs> yeah, there's a resemblance there. And a lot, oftentimes the mom and the dad, they're, they're kind of fighting over, well, which one does he you know, look more like, right? And it's not, just, it's not just physically that they resemble their parents, but their personalities too, right? <laughs> they, their personality kind of, and, and what you're doing as a parent is you're, you're hoping that they will be good representations of you in the world. And, you know, of course, we're not like God. We actually have a lot of imperfections, and we're, we're trying to rid all that stuff from our children to make sure they don't, they don't carry all of our mistakes and all our sins and our faults into the world with them. We're trying to make them the best representatives uh, of our family's reputation and goodness uh, that we can uh, throughout the world. And that, that's really what, what God is doing when he makes us in his image. We're his children expected to go and, and show his glory and spread his character and reputation throughout the earth. And, you know, we know how that went, right? <laughs> Didn't go well. We did not live up to that image. We fell short of his glory. But Paul, and this is what Terry was getting at, takes his language to an even higher plane with Jesus because Jesus wasn't made in the image of God. He is the image of God. He's like that stamp, uh, the exact uh, representation. If you think about it, all human beings are made in the image of Jesus. That's what it's saying. <laughs> Billions of people on this planet, and we're all made in Jesus' image. Hebrews 1, 3, this is what Terry was referencing earlier. He is, Jesus is, the radiance of his glory and the exact representation <laughs> of his nature. God is invisible. Nobody can see him. He's, he's spirit. But when Jesus came in the flesh, he showed us exactly what God looks like, at least his, his character, right? God doesn't, didn't have a body. <laughs> I get that. But, but in his character, it's how Jesus could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, some, use the word stamp. That's really good. Another image is uh, a portrait. You know, you, you, you paint a portrait of someone. It's just this exact, it looks just, just like them. Yeah, really good. It also says that he's the firstborn of all creation. Now, I was caught off guard uh, by this the first time I had a Bible study with Jehovah's Witnesses because they will use this passage to say that Jesus is a created being. They'll say, see, he's born. He, he was not eternal. He, he was born, and he's the firstborn. Well, first of all, they're missing the, the power of the image that he just used, saying that he is the image of God. Jesus wasn't made in God's image. He is the image. He is God. They miss that part. But secondly, Paul is not talking about Jesus being a created being, he's using the term firstborn as a rank, uh, as a term of rank or status, which is very common in the Hebrew scriptures. So for instance, in Exodus 4.22, God says, uh, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Now here's a question. Just speaking of birth order, was Israel the firstborn? No, that was Esau. Esau was a firstborn. And yet what God is saying is, no, Israel is actually my firstborn. It's a, I'm elevating him to a higher status so that he becomes the inheritor of my blessings and my promises and not Esau. Uh, there's another one uh, about David in Psalm 89, 27. I also shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. You see that? that this has nothing to do with you know, David's birth order in his, in his family. It's the idea of the position of rank and status that God is going to give David. And ultimately, this, this passage is a foreshadowing of Jesus, who's the ultimate king, raised up higher than, than all the other kings and authorities and powers of the earth. He is God's firstborn. So, so the point here is that Jesus is the highest in rank over all creation. Nobody higher than Jesus in rank and status. And do you see how Paul, he's really paving the way to encourage the Colossians not to listen to anybody but Jesus. You know, somebody says something different than what Jesus says, they're, he's so much higher in rank than them that you should not pay any attention to those false teachers. There is no higher source in this world, we're out of this world, of knowledge than Jesus. His knowledge is superior. 
Go a little further here, and then I'll open it up for comments. By him, all things were created. So God the Father created the world through the agency of his Son. Not, not just the uh, material world, but even all the spiritual beings in the heavenly places, even all the, the ones that rebelled, you know, all those wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly places that exalt themselves above God and, and try to create division and hostility on the earth. Jesus created all of those beings. They are inferior to him in every way. And not only were they created by him, they were created for him. Every single thing that was created was designed and meant to worship and give glory to Jesus. A really, really powerful thought. He's before all things, which means he is eternal. It's why uh, he called himself by God's name, I am, in John 8. All these humans and even these spiritual powers that are misleading the Colossians and trying to get them to follow some false source of knowledge, they weren't even around when Jesus was. They, they didn't even come onto the scene until much later, and that's only because Jesus created them. He holds all things together. Think about how pro profound this is. You just I, I, It helps me to picture Jesus in his bodily form, and he is just this lowly carpenter from Nazareth. He's walking around, you know, dirty feet from sandals, and he's hanging out with the poor and just the, the rejects of the land. And Paul's saying, you know, that, that man right there, that guy, he's the one that keeps the planets in orbit. I mean, he, he's the one that holds the entire universe together. It's just, it's almost absurd to even think about a, a, somebody having so much power, but also being a human being. But that's what Paul's trying to do. He's trying to get them to see, this is who Jesus is. This is how great and how superior he is. And again, we mentioned in the last class that Colossians 1, it kind of has parallels with Genesis 1. And that, you know, God spoke and his word is what created all of this. And, and, and Paul is showing that actually Jesus was the one who back in Genesis 1, created all these things as well. God, the Father, through Jesus, did that. And I believe, starting in verse 18, he's going to show that the, the new creation in this world, through the power of the gospel, to you know, create flourishing human beings and all that, that's Jesus too. <laughs> he's, he's the one doing that as well. So it's just really remarkable uh, what he's doing here so far in verses 15 through 17. Any comments or questions? on those three verses. <clears throat> yeah, Phil. Since Jesus is the creator and the recreator, to me what that means is that there is there is no creation that God cannot recreate. You know, when we look at a person's life and we see how bad they left God, how far from God they've gotten. We think there's no hope for this guy. What we're saying is we don't believe in God's create, recreative power. Mm -hmm. And that message is what should cause us to reach out to everybody mm -hmm. that are lost. Because if God can truly, you know, we try to create things and we have TV shows where they show a house makeover, where they take a house and strip it all down, get rid of all the stuff that's ruined, and we try to rebuild it all new. Mm -hmm. That's nothing compared to what Jesus can do. Yeah. That's just a physical example of what we want to do because we really don't want to stay in that corrupt state. Mm -hmm. We would really like to recreate if we could and get it back to where we knew again. Yeah, yeah. really good. Yeah, God can recreate anything. And that's really the imagery that he uses all throughout Scripture because in Genesis 1, when he creates man for the very first time, how does he give man life? Yeah, he breathes into them. And in Hebrew, the, the word for breath is the same word for spirit. Same word for wind as well. And, and all throughout the prophets, he uses that imagery. He says, when I recreate you, I'm going to send my spirit one day. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. I'm going to send my holy breath. <laughs> right? and, and when my spirit comes into you, that's going to then reanimate you and recreate you into the human beings that actually walk according to my image, the way you were originally supposed to in Genesis 1. So, yeah, um, the, God has that power to recreate anybody. Nobody is a lost cause. You know, we, we do. Jesus does say, don't, you know, cast your pearls before swine. And we want to have discernment and all that. But 
yeah, we shouldn't look at anybody and say, ah, they're too far gone, like God can't do anything with them. <laughs> if he can make human beings from the dust, I mean, that, at least that person is alive. They're not dust. They're not just dead, you know. But if God can make dead people come to life from the dust, well, he can do the same thing with spiritually dead people. And that's, that's the analogy in the New Testament. Yeah, Debbie. For me, when, when I was reading this, just that, you know, all that he created when I think about thrones and powers and rulers and authorities, they're all created by him and for him. It gives me so much confidence because we I really do fear the powers of this world. Mm -hmm. And I think about how you know I mean I was even thinking about like Abimelech, you know, he's a self appointed prophet and look at how he's so treacherous and he burns people alive and on I so we can be afraid of that, but to know that God created all things for him and to work in accordance with his will gives me a lot of confidence. It gives me a lot of more peace. Yeah, absolutely. And it is scary sometimes that all these powers in the world that think that they have the true power and they do wreak havoc all throughout history, wreak havoc on the church, wreak havoc on Christians, and sometimes we suffer through that. But you know, the New Testament says one day all those rulers and authorities and powers, they're gonna bow the knee to Jesus. Every tongue is gonna confess, every knee is gonna bow before his lordship and recognize his authority. The, the, the real question is for people today, are you gonna to bow to Jesus as king now, or are you gonna to bow to him later? That's really the question. If you bow to him now, things are going to go really well for you. You're going to be invited into this kingdom and have all these blessings. If you wait until the day of judgment to bow before him, it's not good. Eternal punishment. Yeah. Yeah, really, really helpful. Appreciate that. So let's, let's get into the next section here, verse 18 through 20. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, uh, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So this new body that's being created in the new creation, the church, comes from Jesus. So sometimes head means authority. It can also mean source. Well, Jesus is both. He's the source and, and our authority. He's our king. He's the firstborn from the dead. This, this probably, um, again, is not really talking about, well, maybe this is a little bit about birth order, but it's kind of a different kind of birth. It's a birth from the grave of coming back from the dead. And it's not like Jesus is the only one who has ever raised from the dead, but his is completely unique. Because everybody else who raised from the dead, like the widow's son in Nain that we talked about this morning in the Lord's Supper, well, they come back to life, and they live in this world, and then they die again. Jesus is the first one to ever raise from the dead into eternal life. <laughs> and, and he's like the pioneer. The, the idea of firstborn is the idea that he, he started it. Right? He, he's the one that kind of invented this new kind of resurrection. And so... We get to follow him. We, his resurrection from the dead to eternal life means that we get to follow in his footsteps, figuratively at our baptism. You know, we're joining ourselves. We're, we're being raised from the grave in, in kind of a metaphorical sense uh, at our baptism. But then literally in the end, you know, our, our bodies will be resurrected and transformed when Jesus returns. Uh, it says he's, he's first place in everything. I kind of, I don't know, it's just a picture I get in my head when I, like walking into somebody's house and they have this, this whole room, and it's just covered everywhere with trophies. And, you know, all different sports and, you know, academics and instruments, music, all, all that's all these trophies, and every single one of them says first place. <laughs> that would be really impressive. <laughs> and that's, that's really what it is for Jesus. He, he just has first place in everything. He, he wins every award there is. You can, there's, no, there's nothing Jesus is going to win second place in. No. He defeated sin, death. Satan, he wins first place in terms of his authority over all creation. And I think a good takeaway is he needs to win first place in our heart. He's already has first place over everything, but we can choose to make him first in our heart. Um, yeah, go ahead, John. Uh, I agree with I agree with everything with what you say. He, he is. He's, he's the first. 
but sometimes you almost kind of see where people kind of wrap uh, kind of their nationality around this, you know, like, hey, we're number one, we're number one, okay? And you kind of have to be really careful for that because Jesus didn't come on this earth to go around going, I, number one, I'm the lowest, and I'm here to serve you. Sure. But sometimes we could take that and we wrap it around going, look at us, we're the greatest, mm -hmm. right? We're number one. Yeah. And then we forget about that humbling and serving part. And then we want to be entertained, yeah. we want to be served, we want to be number one. Yeah, really good. I mean, how did Jesus come to have first place in everything? By making himself last place in everything on the earth. That, that, that's how he did it. And that's uh, often we don't, we just want to be first place. We don't, we don't want to make ourselves last first. Yeah, Jeff. The thing I saw in was he did number one in suffering. Yeah, we, we can't begin to say, yeah, but he, doesn't, he didn't have the troubles I had. He's not suffered like I he even got number one in suffering, yeah. <laughs> which is not something you really want to do, but he right. did it for yeah. us, and we can't, we can't even outdo him on that. Yeah, can't even outdo Jesus on suffering. He won, he won first place in that. Yeah, really good. Uh, and he talks about this idea of restoration in 19 to 20. Interestingly, the Jews thought that there would be three different figures that were coming to bring restoration for them. They thought there was going to be a king, thought there was going to be a prophet and a priest. But what Paul's saying is actually it was God's good pleasure to bring about reconciliation through one human being who would actually be all three of those things, a prophet, a priest, and, and a king. And it's this just amazing picture of reconciliation, not just with God and human beings, but other parts of creation and even the spiritual realm. And I think it's important to say, let me see I, Okay, I meant to click there. Um, I think it's important to say reconciliation here does not necessarily mean salvation. So, so the, the point here is not, well, one day Satan and all of his demons are going to be reconciled to God and their souls are going to be saved. No, the reconciliation here is the idea of setting all things right by removing all of the evil. So, yeah, you know, there will be some reconciliation where human beings are made right with God and our souls are saved. Uh, but also reconciliation involves removing all, all evil, both of human beings and the, the spiritual beings that are, that are wicked. Um, Paul says in Romans 8 that, that all of creation will benefit from this reconciliation. He says the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Uh, one writer compared what happened to our world with what happens when you have this really great restaurant and you just love it there. And then all of a sudden it just falls under bad management one day and everything changes. And the, the whole restaurant suffers. The food is terrible. The ovens are kind of, you know, not up to par, clean, cleanliness standards. The bathrooms are filthy. There's all kinds of health code violations. And, and what really needs to happen there is you just need to get people in there again who do what they're supposed to do and, and who rule that restaurant the way they're supposed to, to rule. And likewise, God, he, he made all this creation. He created the earth. He made human beings managers over it. But because of sin, it, it's like the whole world just fell under bad management and was suffering from the, the curse of sin. Even, you know, the animals and plants, you know, everybody's groaning over the the suffering here because of sin. So what Jesus came to do is restore all things by creating new human beings who would actually rule in the world the way they were supposed to be the managers they're supposed to be, ruling in the image of God. And when you get rid of the sin problem, that's what leads to restoration. The cross of Jesus gets rid of the sin problem, not only through the forgiveness offered to those who put their faith in him, but also when he comes back in judgment and he punishes all human beings and all spiritual beings that, that rebel against him. And all evil is removed from the picture. This is really what heaven is all about. It's a place where Peter says, only righteousness dwells. Jesus is so great. He brings reconciliation on, on a cosmic scale, the restoration of all things foretold by the, the Old Testament prophets. Now, let me show you one more layer of depth to the section that I think you'll find a really amazing 
<laughs> really, I find it amazing and awesome. To the Jewish mind, all these things that Paul is saying about Jesus is what the Jews believed about wisdom, God's wisdom. Uh, so, for instance, Proverbs 3.19 says, The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. So the Old Testament says God created all things through the agency of his wisdom. And now Paul's saying God created all things through the agency of his son. He's, he's putting Jesus on par with God's wisdom here. Proverbs 8, 22 and 23, the Lord possessed, this is wisdom speaking. His wisdom is personified here. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. From everlasting, I was established from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth. Then I was beside him as a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. So, Again, wisdom's personified as being with God from the very beginning, you know, creating all these things with him. And there is actually a Jewish writing in the 400 years of silence period that's not inspired by God, but it was kind of held in, in high regard uh, by the Jews called the wisdom of Solomon. And in verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 26, it says, For she, that's wisdom, is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, and an image of his goodness. So here wisdom is portrayed as the image of God. So what, what Paul's doing is in this poem, he's showing that Jesus is the embodiment of wisdom itself. It makes sense why Jesus told people about himself, someone even greater and even wiser than Solomon is here. Jesus is the old creator, the original creator. He's the new creator and the embodiment of wisdom itself. Now, let me ask this question. How does appreciating the grandeur of this section help you as a Christian? Debbie actually kind of gave us uh, one answer to that already <clears throat> about giving us peace of knowing Jesus is in control. Yeah. So. Two things. Number one, we know that God's power is sovereign, which means the lesser powers that have been granted power from him can never subdue him, which means that God wins always. God will win in the end. So no matter what he puts us through in this life, whatever suffering or hardship he wants us to go through, he can use that so-called evil for our good to condition us and turn us into that greater image. God has the power to create even with the bad stuff that's in our life. He, he doesn't have to throw it out. Yeah. He can use it to work his glory in it. And we can't. We can't do that with evil. It corrupts us. Yeah. And the other thing is, it, it gives me a hope here that makes me look to the light and stay out of the darkness, stay closer to the light, be drawn closer to it, and not be afraid that I didn't measure up, not be afraid that I didn't finish my work, because God says he's the one that's going to do the work. We're his workmanship in Christ, so he's going to finish that if we stay in Christ. Yeah, really good. Yeah, Tim? The, the grandeur that's here just reminds me not to put God in a box and that everything is much, much bigger than whatever I'm thinking currently about how big my God is. I'm, I'm not, I'm not got it. I'm not there. Yeah. Yeah. Don't try to put God in a box. <laughs> He's much bigger than your, than your box. Yeah. 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 Randy. It, it also helps me see how poor a job I'm doing with being this representative. And showed me how I could be better. Yeah, so it's pretty humbling. You know, see, like, oh, man, <laughs> I'm not living in the image of God the way Jesus did, and, and I need to step that up. Yeah, Matt. From a slightly different angle, I was thinking about this. You know, it, it, it's hard for us, you know, to see this. We know it's true, but it's still hard for your mind. The eternity and the power and the, that Jesus really is God and He came. It's like. We know it's true, but it's still there's an element that's really hard to wrap your mind around. Yeah. And what I was thinking is, it kind of gives me more grace as I think about it for people back then. So we're off hook, but like, the Jews, like, this random poor carpenter dude is to create, like, a sense of, like, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And that's fine, but moving to today, to, like, give people, especially if they come from, I don't know, like, family or some other religion, time, people need time, this is a big 
think, if you have no familiarity with the scripture or you think you know what it is, you've never read it, and you're talking with somebody, yeah. it's going to take some time to process this. This is a big ask. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So it's, it's hard enough for us to process this when we've kind of been hearing it for a long time. But yeah, let's have compassion on those who've never heard this before. And it's going to take time. It's going to take some time because, I mean, that's why Paul says it. It's foolishness to the Gentiles. I mean, stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the, to the Gentiles because it's just really deep, deep stuff. Yeah, well, I hope this will, you know, this section will just increase our reverence for Jesus, um, help, have, help us have more confidence, more hope, you know, be better with uh, evangelism and just recognizing, man, Jesus, Jesus is just so great. He, he really, really is. He's not just another one of these moral teachers that walk the earth. No. In a class of his own. Uh, Colossians now, uh, the, Colossians 1, 21 through 23 is going to talk about the, the reconciliation of the Colossian brethren. He says, although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, it has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Um, I confess to you that one of my fears in studying the book of Colossians is that people will just think, oh, this is just the same as Ephesians, (laughs) because there's so much similarity between these letters. And I actually was a little concerned about it at first. I thought, well, I don't want to get up there and just, you know, repeat everything I said about Ephesians and Colossians. Uh, So I do want to point out that there are similarities, and this section is very similar to a section in in Ephesians. But I want to emphasize the differences in these letters. That's why I spend so much time on the tree imagery and the the poem here in 15 through 20, because those really stand out as as being super different. Well, um, because of that, we're going to cover this section, but not as in-depth as as Ephesians, because it is very similar. Jesus ended the hostility between us and God by taking the punishment of our sins upon his body on the cross, and now we can be cleansed of our sin. And, and I, I do think it helps. Once you have this amazing picture of how great Jesus is in 15 through 20, and now Paul says, oh yeah, and he came and died on a cross in, in, in flesh for your, for your sins so that you could be reconciled. I mean, that, that's just amazing. Once you appreciate the greatness of Jesus, it really helps you appreciate the depths to which he lowered himself on our behalf so that we could be elevated to, to share in, in his greatness. It really is remarkable. I will say that one unique thing in this section from Ephesians is that Paul uses this if clause in verse 23. They'll only be reconciled to God if they continue in the faith and refuse to move away from the truth of the gospel. Paul knows that there's something threatening the reconciliation of the Colossians, and that's this false teaching. And if they fall away and turn away, uh, then you know it's going to mess up their reconciliation with God. So Paul's really telling them, yeah, be grateful for your reconciliation. Recognize you're only going to keep that if you continue in faith uh, with Jesus. Well, since he brought up his ministry, now he's going to talk about that ministry a little bit more here, which, again, is very similar to Ephesians, but I want to point out some differences. In, let's see, I'm trying to make sure I'm managing time well. Uh, let's go ahead and read it. Verse 24 to 29. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God, bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, that is, the mystery, which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. So just to want to point out a few differences here. First of all, in verse 24, he says, I'm filling up what's lacking in Jesus's sufferings. That's kind of an interesting way to say it. But the idea is that Jesus, after he died and resurrected and went to heaven, he wasn't finished suffering. Now, it is true in his body, in his flesh, he did finish all the suffering that was required for our redemption. 
But the idea is now Jesus has a different body, and that's the church in this kind of metaphorical sense, so that Jesus' body is still suffering even after Jesus is in heaven. And that happens when people persecute his church. It's kind of like when he appears to Saul and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus is saying, when you persecute my church, you're actually hurting me. So Paul recognizes that Jesus actually has more to suffer in the body of his church before he returns. And Jesus even said that. He says, people are going to hate you and they're going to persecute you because they hated me. And so Paul's saying, what I'm doing is I'm doing my part to suffer and to fill up that full measure of suffering that Jesus' body, the church, is meant to undergo before he comes back. And he actually rejoices about this because he says, I'm suffering on behalf of Jesus' body. I, I'm doing this for the sake of the church, for the sake of this amazing mystery, which, you know, in Ephesians, he, calls, he says the mystery is that the Gentiles can be fellow heirs in, in the kingdom. Here, he, he words it in a, in a different way, which I think is just so succinct and so powerful. The mystery is Christ in you. It has the same effect of Jews and Gentiles because once Christ is in you, there are no more, you know, distinctions. And like John was talking about, that national pride and all that. No, all that stuff goes out the window when Christ is in you. And we have that hope of, of entering the glory of a transformed body. Uh, God's mystery all along was to take Jesus, the supreme firstborn of all creation, and put him in people's hearts and make people like him. That is just really a profound and amazing thing. And I can see why Paul would say, man, I'd gladly suffer and be thrown in prison for that. This mystery is just worth everything. It's a privilege and an honor to Paul. And the ultimate goal is to get Christ to live in us, to live through us. And that's what Paul says his goal is as a preacher. I want to make every person complete in Christ. I want to bring every person to a point of full maturity so that Christ is in them. You know, every day we look in the mirror, we all change in some way, right? And we, sometimes we obsess over those changes and we wish some changes were happening that it weren't and, and all that. Well, the, the most important change every day of our lives is not something the mirror can show us. It's whether or not we're becoming more like Jesus. C.S. Lewis he said, the church exists, <clears throat> oops, sorry, I'm behind. The church exists for nothing else <clears throat> but to draw men into Christ, to make them little Christs. <laughs> if they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. Paul's goal, it wasn't just to go around and teach people good morals and how to be nice people. Even atheists can have good morals and, and be nice people. What Paul's goal is is, is that we remove ourselves completely. We die to our old selves so that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the way that that's possible is if we spend every day filling ourselves with the wisdom and knowledge of Jesus because his knowledge is superior. Any questions or comments? I actually gave you a minute and a half at the end of class. So. <laughs> Terry? I really liked it. Uh, what you said last week, you know, about uh, better evangelism and how we're bringing Christ to people. And I like that in, the, in verse 18 when Christ will have first place in everything. We have to remember that and whenever we're, whenever we're preaching Christ to people, that we don't necessarily need to look at the wrongs that they're doing in their life. They need Christ in their lives. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. we're, not a, we're not a moral template to follow. Yeah, really good. It's a crisis. So that's, that's the message of need. Yeah, good. Yeah. And that, that will help our evangelism. Instead of trying to fix all the things they're doing, that person's doing wrong, we're going to put, try to get Christ in their heart. And then all those things will take care of themselves. It's like, you know, there's a, there's a tree and then there's the branches. And if, if you want to take down a tree, I mean, you can waste your time clipping all those branches if you want, or you can just cut the trunk, right? And, and get to the heart of the matter. And that's what Jesus will do. He'll, he'll chop the whole tree down and then rebuild a new one that actually bears fruit in his image. Yeah, Will? First off, more of a comparison. Mm -hmm. Second, um, I don't think we should all forget how it was happening when I was in the um, And that should still be given into consideration whether we were in Christ or not. Okay, yeah. So, so like, it's not taking away who you are. Who you are. 
Yeah, that's a good point. So we still, even though Christ is in us, we still maintain you know, our uniqueness as, as individuals. God works through us each individually uh, with our, our own talents and, and gifts and abilities. Yeah, really good, really good thought. All right, I really appreciate uh, your comments and questions and good attention. And we'll pick up there on Wednesday night in 2-8.